All right, our next presenter uh, really needs no introduction, but um, I'm going to do my best here. Bruce Edgerly, or Edge, as most people know him, is a co-founder of Backcountry Access, or BCA. Um, it, BCA has been uh, a longtime supporter of Friends of CAIC and Avalanche Education in general. Uh, Edge was actually a former board member of ours. He's a current board member of AAA. He, uh, their company has been actively involved in research, education, um, snow safety. That's why they founded the company. They provide their employees education along the way. Edge just got back from uh, Pro 2 in Jackson. Um, and so they're just, it's hard, hard to find someone who's dedicated more and uh, just given more to the safety community than Edge here. So we're lucky to have him and uh, we'll take it away. Great. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks, Brian. Yeah, we, we really appreciate our relationship with CAIC. It's been a, a great one. In fact, the very first fundraisers ever thrown for the friends of CAIC. Uh, we're right here at the American Mountaineering Center. Did anybody make it to those parties? The Avalanche Jam? <laughs> Zero. Well, yeah. That's why it moved up to Breckenridge. Ethan was there. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, yeah, it was great. Um, but Aaron's done a much better job than us. Um, so thanks to Aaron at the Friends for doing such a great job. Um, yeah, I just got back from a Pro 2 up in Jackson. Those guys are awesome. Uh, up there at the American Avalanche Institute, and I've dug enough ECTs, Ron, to last me a lifetime in one week. Um, okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of a nerdy subject, um, electromagnetic interference and avalanche transceivers. Um, fact, fiction, and the 2050 rule. So we're going to talk about um, some facts, some fictions, and how to avoid uh, noise interfering with a search. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about um, just some basics about transceivers. Um, we're going to talk about the difference between active and passive electromagnetic interference, which some people will just abbreviate to EMI or noise. Um, environmental noise. Um, transmit, we're going to, in order to understand what noise really is, um, uh, we need to talk about transmit pulses and what they look like and how you can pull those out of the noise uh, that, they're, that they're kind of embedded in just coming from those lights and this computer and <clears throat> power lines and things. So we'll show you how a, a transceiver does that. Um, I'll show you what the symptoms are when you experience noise problems. Usually it's in the form of either false triggers, which are distance and directional displays that don't really make sense, um, or decreases in your receive range, where if you're too close to a device that's got some electronics operating inside, it interferes with the ability to process the signal and therefore you lose receive range. I'll show you how that happens. Uh, we have done some testing uh, over the years, and uh, we went through a whole other round this fall, and I'll show you the results. Um, and a lot of that um, kind of resulted in this 2050 rule that you might have seen recently that's um, come out. Um, we'll talk about snowmobiles. Um, snowmobiles are actually pretty doggone noisy. Um, so there's a whole different set of rules for sleds. Um, and then we'll talk about some kind of misnomers about transceivers. Uh, that's the fiction part. Um, try to put those to rest. Um, and I'm hoping maybe uh, if we have time left over, we can do a little bit of noise hunting. I brought some, um, some tools here to do that. My trusty Ortovox F1, which uh, I might go ahead and just use during the presentation. Because I did a little bit of noise hunting before. And it's actually pretty complicated in here right now uh, with all this electronics. So I'm not sure how much noise hunting we're going to be able to do. But <clears throat> then we'll get into the Q&A. Um, I'm hoping we'll have some good, robust questions so you can try to stump the chump. All right, let's just talk about nomenclature here. Uh, I did notice today we had some, 
some venomous comments on our Instagram page about why are we using the term beacons. Uh, well, we try not to. Uh, actually, the only reason we use the word beacon at BCA is for SEO. Generally, we try to use the word transceiver, but not everybody uses that word. And we don't want to lose those people, so every once in a while, we'll mix the word beacon in on our website. But you'll notice tonight, I use the word transceiver because I don't care about SEO right now. So um, these are beacons. A beacon is a device that's meant to attract attention. So that lighthouse, for instance, is meant to attract a lost sailor's attention. This is a personal locator beacon um, made by ACR. It sends out a distress signal. But there's no two-way communication there. Um, it doesn't receive anything. So, and then this is a dog beacon. So it's basically a flashing light you put on your dog. That's a beacon. Um, so let's try to use the word transceiver um, just for um, nomenclature reasons and clarity. Um, this is one that bugs me. As soon as somebody calls a transceiver a transponder, they kind of lose me uh, as, as a bit of a gaper, actually. Um, <laughs> so uh, anybody, anytime anybody calls a transceiver a transponder, I would probably put them through a good trailhead test to make sure they're, they're legit. <laughs> Um, this is a picture of the, uh, the transponder I put on my windshield when I drive to DIA and I go down the Northwest Parkway and pay 20 bucks each way. Um, pretty brilliant piece of technology because that way you don't actually see the money leaving your hand. Um, if, if it weren't for this thing, I probably would just drive down 36, take I-70, 270, and then up Pena Boulevard. But instead, I am blind to the cash leaving my bank account. Anyways, that's a transponder. But we're talking about transceivers uh, because we transmit and we receive. I like to use the word search because it's a more active verb. Um, we're searching. We're not just receiving. You can, you can receive a signal and just sit there and flail around and do nothing. But what we do is we search. We act on what we're receiving. That's why we use the word search. OK, so a couple things about transceivers. Um, just, just talking about this, because we get a lot of questions. And I figured I'd answer them before the Q&A came up. So um, replace your batteries before they reach 40%, um, at least on our transceivers. But I think most manufacturers will probably agree. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that a transceiver uses a lot more power in search mode than it does in transmit mode. And it uses a lot more power than that when it's actually receiving a signal and displaying a signal because it's lighting up all those LEDs, it's lighting up the directional lights, it's burning through a lot more power when it's actually receiving a signal. So it's actually kind of a good sign when somebody shows up at your trailhead test and they're down to 63% battery power. That means either They've been practicing, or they didn't take their, their batteries out of their transceiver over the summer. That's not a good sign. But anyways, is this one ready to go out in the field? I don't know. I usually change mine out at about 60%, because if I do some searching and a bunch of trailhead tests, and I hit the beacon training park, transceiver training park, um, you know, I might, might get down to 40. Um, so I usually will switch mine out at 60. Um, only use high quality alkaline batteries, not lithium batteries, because that doesn't work so well with the, cal the way that the uh, transceivers calibrate the battery power. And also, don't use cheap batteries from Amazon, Kirkland, Vinergy, or any of these other, especially if, like, if it's not in English, eh, maybe, I don't know. Um, so, we use energizers. They seem to be the most consistent quality. There's not as much variation between each battery. And the thing to remember about batteries is it's least common denominator. If you have one battery that's bad, um, all the others kind of sink down to that level. Um, so never mix and match 
the age of your batteries. Don't put an old one in with a couple of new ones or brand. Remove them over the summer. And if you do have corrosion in there, you can clean it up with a Q-tip and some alcohol. It works really great. Um, you, can, you can clean them up yourself. Don't call us. We don't cover corrosion. Nobody covers corrosion. No warranties there. OK, any questions there? Uh, we'll, we'll move on. But Q&A. All right, transceivers work great if you know how to use them. Um, so you got to practice. You all know that. Um, has anybody here um, practiced with their vegan this year? Good. Well, that's great. Um, this is the Beacon Training Park up at A Basin. Uh, we pioneered a new route uh, last year called what we called Butt Crack to Beacon Basin Traverse. So you go up to the Butt Crack, off Grizzly there, ski down, then you skin up to uh, Dog Leg, ski that, and then you skin over to the uh, Beacon Training Park at Lenaway. It's a great tour, and then you can practice. So that's what we're doing here. Um, and if you're good enough, then you can save a life. So this is a good example of how lots of practice and training paid off. Just mm, two or three weeks ago, uh, this is uh, one of our athletes, Adam Yu. He got buried in uh, Japan. I happened to be out with him in the morning. And they decided to go further up and ski this while we were skiing the other side. Uh, group triggered a slide up above them. Took out three people, two were killed. Adam was buried for 25 minutes under a meter and a half of snow. It just so happened that there was a guide and a guide apprentice up on this ridge uh, when it happened, uh, a guide from uh, Whitecap Alpine up in Pemberton, BC. And he immediately skied down to the debris pile, did a beacon search, got going on Adam, got his, his guests were all medical professionals. He set up a strategic shoveling conveyor uh, system, and they got to Adam in 25 minutes. Uh, 25 minutes is, usually, is a little past that window, 15 minutes, and a meter and a half is pretty deep. Um, but Adam is good at being buried. He's very psychologically strong, and he said to himself, I just need to relax, slow down my breathing, think about nothing. And it worked. He did tell me that when he was under there, he remembered doing a trailhead check and just was so stoked that he knew he was transmitting. Um, <laughs> so practice with your transceiver. All right. But they're not perfect. Um, not only do you have to practice with them, but if you make them work harder than they want, you can slow them down, you can confuse them, you can overwhelm them. Um, there's a lot of math and statistics and processing that goes into separating a legitimate transceiver signal from the noise that's surrounding you uh, from the environment. Um, so this is, <laughs> that's actually me. Look at all the stuff I have hanging off of me. GoPro on my chest, radio here, transceiver there, hydration trigger, all kinds of stuff. But that was kind of before we really were hypersensitized to this noise issue. Um, so let's talk about the difference between active and passive noise sources. There's a big difference. Active noise sources are um, operating electronic electronic devices that are putting out things. Um, usually it's the display, like that display, oh, that's my daughter and that's my son. Um, when the display is on, it's a noticeably noisier device. Um, and so what that does is it, it just increases the noise that has to be filtered out so that you can see the signal. Um, so heated gloves is kind of a hot new one, you know. One reason why this subject has gotten so um, hypersensitive recently is that there's so many, well, there's so many more backcountry users out there now, especially since COVID, 
but also there's so many new electronic devices that have come out in the last few years, um, including heated gloves, heated socks, which are awesome. If you don't have a pair, you might want to get them. Um, smart watches. Um, yeah, so those are the big three, Bluetooth earbuds. Um, so those can cause decreases in receive range. I'll show you why. False triggers, false multiple victim icons on your screen. So even though there's only one signal out there, it might show you two or more. Um, and also, there's some transceivers out there that will tell you to decrease your search strip widths if there's noise. Well, that's kind of a, a, a good thing. Um, so, but that's, that's one indicator that maybe you're getting noise is if you have a transceiver that does that and it goes from like 70 meter search strip width diagram to 20 meter search strip width diagram. These are all good reasons to go out and use your, your transceiver and practice with it, not just to work on your technique, but to be able to recognize when you have noise and when you have a legitimate signal. It, when you, if you do it enough, you'll notice, okay, this signal I'm getting has no cadence, it's irregular, it's really high and jumpy, and you can start to see the differences. So I actually like to go out into a noisy environment to practice being able to manually figure out if it's noise or a legitimate signal. Even if you have really great transceiver skills and you pe can pass an ACMG guiding exam, still the noise thing is another thing that you need to learn. Um, passive noise, this is when there's a metallic object near your transmitting unit. It can actually attenuate or weaken the signal being transmitted. So, Active noise sources affect the search function. Passive noise sources affect the transmit function. Um, I haven't found this to be a huge problem. Um, you might get slightly larger distance readings. Your directional arrows might jump around a little bit more. But if you just keep moving, if you just go in the direction it's telling you generally, it's going to get much cleaner the closer you get. The thing about avalanche transceiver signals is they're very, very powerful when you get close. And they're pretty weak uh, the further out you get. And it's a cubic function. Um, so if you can just get closer, things are going to get much better much faster. Keep that in mind. Just keep moving. Um, you know, one thing about passive devices or passive noise sources. You can't even call it noise, it's interference. It's because there's metal between the transmit antenna and the searching person. Um, is that it, it can suck up more battery power. It's just physics that um, when metal, other metal objects kind of interfere with the transmit antenna, um, it, it draws more current from the transmitter. I'm not going to explain why, but um, you could go through your batteries faster, let's say, if you were Adam, and let's say you were already at 60% when you started out, and you're buried for 25 minutes, the rate of, of the burn rate on your battery is going to be faster if you have metal over your uh, transceiver. That's transmitting. Um, so these include such things as a shovel. Now, I don't carry my shovel on my chest, and I don't carry my shovel in my pants pocket. I carry it back here. Not an issue. Phones. Well, those can be active or passive, because there's metal in there. So if you have that over your transmitting unit, um, you could affect the signal a little bit. Um, and this is pretty likely. I mean, I, I wear my transceiver in a harness. I don't like to wear it down here. And I, I, I have a nice chest pocket. I love to put my phone in so I can take pictures and use my nav app, but I try not to. Um, I put it over here, which I don't really like, but I do. 
Um, and then foil. You've probably heard about this. Um, tin foil can actually act as a bit of an attenuation uh, material and weaken the signal a little bit. So uh, maybe don't put your lint chocolate in your chest pocket, put it in your backpack. Um, but even if it is there, it's not going to ruin the search. Okay, so just move forward. Environmental noise. Okay, so this is, who can tell me where this is? Is that steam on? No. Monarch. Monarch, no. Well, um, I was just up there. I took, yes, very good. <laughs> yeah, I took that picture. That's my, uh, that's my Pro 2 course right there. Um, we were not doing our transceiver searching there. We were on our way up to Olympic Bowl to do a bunch of ECTs. Um, but in this case, um, you're probably going to lose some range. Um, I've been in situations, I remember uh, one time I set up a, a portable beacon training park, <coughs> transceiver training park in uh, Japan, <laughs> and um, it was right outside the, uh, the quad, the base of the quad at Moiwa Ski Resort. I figured, oh, I'll get lots of, lots of people, lots of traffic going by. I'll get a bunch of people coming through, and we'll make it fun. Well, I was getting like five meters range. You know, I just, it took me 15 minutes before I figured it out is that I was right on top of the underground power line. I busted out my trusty Ortovox F1. I bring one of these with me everywhere. Um, and sure enough, the thing lit up like a, uh, like a, uh, like Las Vegas. So this is an analog transceiver. Does anybody own one of these? Right on, good. Um, well, get rid of it. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I'll take it. I'll, I'll give you a good deal on a new tracker because I have a fleet of these and we give them to all our reps and we use them to, to hunt for noise. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, so the nice thing about these is all they do is they amplify basically everything that's somewhere near 457 kilohertz and then it's up to you to, to walk around in a fancy grid search pattern and determine when it's getting louder or softer and then you have to adjust the sensitivity control along the way. But I just put it on the highest level and you can, you can hunt for noise this way. So you hear that? I'll put my mic up to it. Okay, that thing's just screaming at me. Now, do you carry one of those in the backcountry? Maybe Ron does. I don't. Um, Here's this, I notice uh, this one over here. This is the, uh, this thing's just nuts. I'm not sure what that thing is, but it's some kind of AV relay. And I noticed there was a hot spot here. It seems to be kind of on and off. Um, so yeah, that's basically, um, if you have, EMI, you can sniff it out this way, any, any, any kind of noise source. And we'll play around with this a little later if we have the time, maybe. Okay, so what is electromagnetic noise? Well, I'm, it, it's not this kind of noise with a bunch of yahoos in the uh, back country with, you know, one man band. Um, it's electrical noise. You can't actually hear it. Like, I can't hear that computer right now. I can't hear that AV panel thing. Um, it's not like that bass drum. Um, it's all physics. So let's take a look at the physics. This is what the ideal uh, pulse train looks like. Um, you have a pulse being transmitted every one second or so. There's a very strict set of standards that uh, has been laid out for the transceiver manufacturers and uh, this is what it looks like in an ideal situation where you have uh, on, on this scale is time. So this is probably about four seconds worth of time. And then on the y-axis would be uh, signal strength. 
uh, uh, the strength, the amplitude of the signal. So beep, beep, beep. And in between the beeps is a bunch of noise. Um, and that's what we're talking about. It's electromagnetic noise. And um, it's actually, this is very manageable. It's uh, almost a, a flat line there. The signals are much greater than what we call the noise floor. But when that noise floor comes up and it's even with the signal amplitude, that's when you lose the signal. And when it's higher, then you've completely lost the signal. So the closer I get to this laptop, the higher the noise floor goes, and eventually I can't hear the signal. And it's the same thing with a digital transceiver. The machine can't, can't pull the pulses out of the noise anymore once that noise floor is higher than the pulse amplitude. Um, okay, so what does it look like in the real world? More like that. It's not a flat line. It's, there's all kinds of weird stuff out there that the processor has to sort through and it does a bunch of statistics and then it tries to recognize patterns and it eliminates randomness. And so you'll see there's a bunch of random spikes in here. This could be from anything. It could be from that laptop. It could be from maybe this phone in my pocket. Uh, could be um, people turning things on and off. A lot of times when you, when you switch something on, it spikes and then it kind of, uh, then it evens out. Um, and then this here is the signal. That's one pulse mixed in with a bunch of noise and a few spikes in the noise. So we have to figure out a way to eliminate these so they're not displayed as signals on our searching unit. And we have to pick this pulse out of all this stuff. So th that's not so hard right now because we've got a good distance between the top of that and, the, and all this. And these don't look very much like that. They're, they're narrower. They don't fit the definition of, the, of a pulse width from a transceiver. So this is, uh, this is actually a good example of um, false triggers. So um, those, those, that's Lynn Wolf. Anybody here know Lynn? She taught our Pro 2 course. She's so awesome. She's the best. If you ever take a course up at uh, AAI, ask for Lynn. So yeah, she, we, we had our debrief at the uh, old Wilson schoolhouse, and she came up to me and said, have you, ever, have you tried these electric socks? These things are a game changer, because it was really freaking cold. And uh, I said, no, but uh, is, it, is it okay if I run my transceiver up your, up your skirt? <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is what it looked like. Can you hear the sound? No. Well, you don't really need the sound, um, but um, we'll rewind. I'll just show you what it looks like to have false trigger. So you'll see in the display right there, 16, 22. And so that's happening right where the battery pack is. Not there, the 20, as soon as I get back up to that battery. But it's kind of random, you know, and you really have to be up next to it. Um, so that's the kind of thing, it's nice to know how to, to recognize something that's not a legitimate signal. So theoretically, if you were doing a fine search and you were down like this, and you were running your, your brackets past that battery pack, well, you might get a false trigger. Um, however, what was the distance reading on that display? Yeah, it was like 20. Well, 22-ish. Yeah, I was jumping around a little bit. But, um, 
what's my, what's my distance reading going to be when I'm, by definition, when I'm in the fine search on my hands and knees? It's going to be less than three meters. And an avalanche transceiver is programmed to show you the strongest signal, not all the signals at once, just the strongest signal. So in the fine search, this is not a problem. Um, it's going to show me this three meter or less signal here, and it's going to ignore this one right here. It might even be closer because it thinks it's 22 meters away. So all this stuff is not an issue in the fine search. So last summer, we did a ton of testing uh, in Bear Creek Park in Boulder and then in Beacon Alley, which is behind our shop, where we have grids uh, spray painted on the Skunk Creek Trail, Beacon Alley. And uh, basically figured out that it's never a problem in the fine search. Um, what we really found was that the signal search and the course search or when you see issues with noise. In the course search, oh, sorry, in the signal search when you do not have a signal and you're trying to pick up a signal and you're um, gridding through the area, trying to pick up a signal, the issue is you could pick up a false trigger, let's say from your heated sock, or let's say from a GoPro on your chest, or maybe from your phone. Unlikely. Um, and you might think you have a signal and you're going to chase that thing around like a, a dog chasing his tail. And that did happen, we believe, uh, in Canada. Um, I think it was uh, an area called Spring Creek. Um, and there was a fatality due to asphyxiation in that case. Um, now, I'm not sure if anybody knows whether or not it was truly false triggers that they were chasing around, but they were nowhere near the victim. Uh, and yet they had signals being displayed. So again, go out and practice so that if that happens to you, you can say to yourself, this doesn't sound right. This sounds irregular. It's, it's got to be noise. Keep moving. Um, so that's a good example of a false trigger. And let me just show you another false trigger. So this is uh, Tracker 4. Um, and uh, so right now, that actually sounds pretty regular, doesn't it? Hold on. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, we'll get without the big gun. There's a false trigger. Okay, so that's what false triggers look like. Um, range loss. This is another thing that you should learn to recognize. So um, that's when the the noise, the background noise, is actually covering up the signal. So right here, it's, the signal is almost kind of lost right here. And, and this is when you start losing a signal. So if I had a, uh, a transmitter 25 meters away and I took a, um, a phone and put it up, then once I got really close, then I might all of a sudden no longer have a signal because the noise floor has gone over the pulse. Um, and I have a uh, video here of what that looks like. 
So this is a smart watch, my wife's Apple watch. And uh, you'll see that, now one thing to notice is that sometimes these effects are kind of amplified if you have what we call a delayed display transceiver, a uh, transceiver uh, that has a little bit more uh, lag time between when it receives a pulse and when it actually displays the information. Um, so like we noticed with snowmobiles, for instance, you could, um, has anybody here ever experienced signal drag where if you're receiving a signal and you walk away from the transmitted unit, you actually could go way past where you would expect to lose range. And then when you come back in, you have a lot less range. It's because the transceiver is, has memorized that signal and it, it, it's able to um, interpret it better if it already has pattern recognition. But if you have no pattern recognition because you walked in from 100 meters away, then it takes longer for it to figure out, okay, that's a legitimate signal. We call that signal drag. That's, if you do a, a range test with your friends at the beginning of a ski tour, don't walk away transmitting uh, and have your friends in search mode because that's not a legit test. You need to start out of range and come back in. So the same thing applies with noise is you can actually drag the noise with you. Um, so this is something that we saw with snowmobiles, um, is that if you get off your sled, you should never do a transceiver search on a sled because you're not gonna pick up a signal. There's too much noise coming out of the engine. Um, so generally, like in a gigantic avalanche, you might actually try to do a signal search on the sled, but that would be like going up the flanks and just spot checking on the way up would be one strategy. Um, but you gotta get off the sled because um, you're gonna drag that noise with you as you get away from the sled, a couple of meters. So anyways, that's why it says, well, it doesn't say that yet, but. Anyways, uh, we'll I'll show you that. So this is an Apple Watch, and notice how I've got a signal now, it's 28 meters away. And after a while, it goes away. Even though it's still 25 meters away, I, I have no signal. Okay, so now I'm pulling my hand away with the watch on it. And you'll see there's a little delay, like I just mentioned. This is a delayed display transceiver. And, uh, okay, so the signal came back after a while. We'll play that again. Okay, so I have the signal now, and it takes a while for this transceiver to register the noise. Okay, now the signal's gone. It's telling me to do a signal search, even though the position of the transmitter hasn't changed. Okay, and then as soon as I took my hand away, I got the signal back. So that's the kind of thing you'll see if you have a noise source next to your transceiver. Um, this is why there's a new step to the transceiver check at the trailhead now. Hands and wrists. Show me your wrists, show me your hands. I don't wanna see electric gloves. If you have electric gloves, you need to know they come off or you turn them off uh, when you start a search. We have found that uh, when they're not on, it's not a problem. Um, so you just need to know that stuff. Um, and the Apple Watch, just put it on, the, on your non-searching wrist. If you're a right-handed searcher, put it on your left hand. Okay, does that make sense? Um, okay, here's another one, heated gloves. Um, this is uh, one of our ambassadors, Mike Duffy. He's our, one of our snowmobile instructor ambassadors. Um, you'll see he's got uh, Tracker 4. And there's a tracker S out here somewhere. So right now, he's probably 10 meters away and he has no signal. Uh, he's coming in, coming in. I think the beacons, the transceiver is out here somewhere. 
Okay, now he has a signal. Um, so yeah, the, it's in that glove, I think. Kind of hard without the sound, but um, heated gloves are an issue. So hands and wrist check at the trailhead. It's mainly the snowmobilers that are using these uh, heated garments. Uh, you'll, they, there's heated jackets now, and there's heated mid layers. Um, but it's usually right around the battery pack that you're going to get these false triggers or, or range loss issues. This is a, a separate issue, but I thought I'd bring it up because sometimes it gets mixed up with, with the noise issue. Uh, this is the issue uh, in multiple burials of signal overlap. So wh while we're looking at signals, let's just see what that problem's all about because the solution can be this very similar. <coughs> so this is the same signal here that we had before, <clears throat> but now there's a second victim, victim two, and, and that person is further away. You'll see the, the signal strength amplitude is lower. So they're like um, 30 meters away instead of 15 meters away. And not much noise. It's manageable. Well, the problem is, you know, no, normally uh, you'd have maybe a big signal here and then a smaller signal here and a big signal here and a small signal. But here they're merging. And, and it starts to look like one transmit pulse. Um, well, so that becomes difficult for the transceiver to manage because it, 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 one of the pulses is being covered up by the other one. Um, so you'll see that sometimes when you have uh, two burials out there and you had two icons, two, two bodies showing up on your display, it might go down to one for a while. Well, that's because of this signal overlap, and it might, might be even worse. You could have three out there, and at one point, it'll say there's two, or maybe even one, for a little while. Um, so that's signal overlap. It's a separate issue, but you should be aware of it. Um, and, and it's a real problem if you have one of these guys with, was that you? That, that owns one of these? <laughs> yeah. So this is awesome for noise hunting, but it's actually not a very good transmitter because it uh, has a very long pulse, very wide. You know, it goes beep, beep, beep instead of beep, beep, beep. Uh, so when you have a few of those out there, they can cover each other up really easy and for a very long period of time, um, in which case your marking function probably isn't going to work because it's just not clear which pulse to suppress. And it makes it very difficult to count the number of victims. So that's why you should learn how to do alternate search strategies. If, if your marking function fails, or if you just you don't trust the number of victims that you're seeing on the screen, um, you might be better off getting out of marking and just walking around in a grid pattern in search mode and just searching based on signal strength. Um, and I think Manuel Genswein's here somewhere. Um, he, yeah, so uh, he can tell you all about micro search stripping. Um, but um, learn how to use signal strength, not just marking in a multiple burial in case your marking function doesn't work or in case you don't trust the number of icons that you're seeing. Okay, so yeah, th we did some testing, like I mentioned, in uh, Bear Creek Park, Beacon Alley, which we're renaming Transceiver Alley. And uh, then I went out just a month ago or so for a couple of days. Uh, Janie came out for a day. I had Austin from CAIC for, for that day. That's Austin, that's Janie. Um, and we really wanted to make sure we didn't have any EMI. Like last summer, we were getting environmental noise in Beacon Alley. It was driving me nuts. So I, I could, the tests, um, 
only the fine searching tests really were legit. So I did find this area up above the CAIC, you know, they're, they're in Boulder at uh, NIST. Up the hill a ways in the open space up above the cemetery. Uh, I went out there at different times of day, five days in a row, to make sure that there was no electromagnetic noise, false triggers, before we even started doing this. Uh, but we went out there and did, uh, did the course search and signal search part of this testing all over again. And basically we had a transceiver, a transmitter that was 20 meters out, pointed at an angle, uh, and we marked off 100 centimeters, 50 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 10 centimeters, and then we would touch the transmit unit. So we'd have a transmit unit here aligned with the trans, oh, sorry, receiving unit here in search, aligned with the flux line coming in at a curve from 20 meters out, and we would take a, a noise source like a phone and put it here at 100 meters and just bring it into 50 to 20 to 10 and see when we lost the signal. So that was to check the, the range loss issue. And then the other test we did was we just turned the transceiver on uh, with no transmitter to see if we got any false triggers. So those were the two kind of tests we ran and we did uh, a half a dozen different models of transceivers and a ton of different noise sources. Okay, so yeah, beware of environmental noise in urban settings. It's not really a legit place to practice uh, unless you want to get practice with noise. But in this case, we didn't really want the noise. Um, and then uh, a week later, I went out with Andy Wenberg, our snowmobile sales manager, lives up in Leadville. We met at Vail Pass and we put up a sign, test your sled for electromagnetic interference with avalanche transceivers at Shrine Pass bathrooms. Free swag. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we got probably a half a dozen, maybe a few more people to stop by, but they were always in a rush. <laughs> so, but we did get some work done and uh, this is where we discovered this noise drag issue. Um, especially with delayed display transceivers. Um, but we did notice um, that, uh, yeah, you need more, more margin with snowmobiles. Uh, we, had, we had done this in the past, um, not quite as, as thorough, um, and, and found that um, you had to be at least a meter away before you could really um, wouldn't experience range loss issues. Um, but the results this time around were a little bit more dramatic. It, it was more like two meters out, you, you'd still have noise. And I think the newer sleds, because the last time we did this was probably five years ago. The newer sleds have more, first of all, they're more powerful. Um, and second of all, they have more electronics. I mean, these Polaris sleds, these new uh, Polaris, um, RMKs have gigantic screens on them with maps, navigation, and um, you know, all the, all the gauges are electronic now, so they put out a ton of noise. Um, actually, we found out more than the skidoos. Um, so we have all the results in a chart here. So what we did was uh, just kind of, I tried to kind of lay it out in terms of um, vulnerability to noise. And um, so the distance at which you would experience noise issues. Um, so you'll see, uh, so green means no effects whatsoever. Uh, red means either false triggers in a signal search when you have no transmitter out there or loss of range when there is a signal out there. How far out do those things happen? And you'll see that with the snowmobiles, the Polaris snowmobiles, we were getting um, definite problems out to 100 centimeters away, a meter. Um, and then you could drag the signal even further. On the way in, 
it was more like 100, and on the way out, it was more like 200. <clears throat> so that's why we say, get three meters away from your sled before you even think about searching. Uh, the skidoo was a little, a little bit less noisy, um, but still noisier than any of these personal electronics. So you want to get at least <clears throat> two meters away just to get out of the yellow. <laughs> All right, so then from the top, FRS radio. So let's see, what's an example of an FRS radio? Anybody here have an FRS radio? Well, this is the world's finest FRS radio, the, the BC Link. Um, not an issue. It's an awesome, awesome device for communicating with your group. Um, the, the sledders really love them. But I mean, even if you put the thing right up next to your, and put it on top, even the battery pack, the, the mic, definitely no problem, and the base unit with the battery in it, definitely no problem, just right on top of the um, searching transceiver, which is refreshing, it's nice to know. Um, InReach, another awesome product, I keep one of those in my pack all the time. Um, it's got a really small black and white screen. Um, basically, you have to be touching a searching transceiver to experience false triggers. And uh, I couldn't get any range loss putting that thing up when I was searching. Um, heated garments, you hear a lot about those. And yeah, you can get false triggers and range loss like we saw with the heated gloves. But the reason they're an issue is because you're wearing them and you're holding the friggin' beacon. Um, and the battery pack on my my climb glove is right here. It's right there. It's like 10 centimeters from my searching unit. Um, so that's why they're an issue, because they're so close to the searching unit. Same thing with the Apple Watch. If it's on your right hand and you're searching with your right hand, well, that, that's going to be an issue. Um, but long underwear or whatever, you know, they make these heated long underwear now. It's pretty awesome. Um, I don't know. The battery's over here. So generally, I'm not. I'm not over here, I'm, I'm over here, because I'm a righty, so I don't know. It's not, not that big of a deal. Um, iPhone, well, this is probably the one you hear about the most. Um, let me show you how close you need to be to, to experience issues. Okay, so here's, here's my phone. Yes, that's my, my son and my daughter and my dog. So I've got the display on. That's, that's when you're gonna get the noise when the display is on. Airplane mode has nothing to do with it. And I'll show you that. So right now, so that, that's the noise overpowering the signal. I've got a signal out there. Transmitting, and you can you can kind of barely hear the signal now. Now the signal is crystal clear, but now the noise floor is getting close to the height of that signal. Okay, so now let's uh, let's go into airplane mode. I only have two hands, so I can't get my reading glasses out right now. <laughs> All right, I'm not in airplane mode now. Now I'm in airplane mode. It's the same amount of noise. It's the screen. And it's the processing that's, that's controlling the screen. So I might get a false trigger if I'm here, but am I going to search like this? Am I going to search like this? No, I'm not. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, what is it? There's airplane mode, and uh, 
Let's see if I can get the screen to go off. Okay, so does that make sense? If that screen goes off, we'll, uh, we'll try this again. Why not? Okay, I just I just clicked the screen off. Oh yeah. There, it's off now. It's really not changing much, is it? But as you can see, the, uh, the distances are pretty tight. So there's a lot of, lot of hype over iPhones. I, uh, I, I don't, I've never turned off my iPhone. I, uh, I keep it in my pocket, and I use the navigation apps all the time. And I want to, uh, only reason I go into airplane mode is to save batteries so I can use my navigation app and so that I can make a phone call if I have a problem or if I'm going to be late for supper. Um, OK, so that's phones. And yeah, there's, there's variations between phones. Uh, some of them are cheaper than others, and they put out a little more noise. Um, but I've, I'm still, I'm, I've been hunting around and I haven't found any that really have issues any further than 10, meter, 10 centimeters away. Uh, GoPros. Um, yeah, so those are similar, you know, a little bit, a uh, little bit different because sometimes people put them on their chest. And um, if you're searching, if your GoPro is on and you're searching right next to it, well, you're probably going to have a, it's probably going to um, reduce your range. You might not pick up a signal until you outstretch your hand. Um, that's the solution. Well, the solution is don't put, don't put a GoPro on your chest. Put it up here. Um, <laughs> or put it in your mouth like some of these guys at BCA, some of these hot uh, ski uh, uh, athletes they have. So, um, yeah, just don't put it on your chest. And if it is on your chest for some reason, extend your arm. That'll give you 50 centimeters distance, and you won't have any issues. Um, now, what about recording? Does it matter whether or not it's recording or not? No, we haven't seen any differences. Right, Jane? Right. Yeah. OK. This one kind of took me by surprise, uh, the Apple Watch. And it's the same thing as the heated gloves. Is uh, you know, maybe 10 centimeters out and in, you're going to lose some signal, like we saw in the video. And if there's not a signal out there, then you might get false triggers that close in. But the only reason it's an issue is because it's, it's on your freaking wrist, right next to your transceiver. OK, electronic airbag. There's been some talk about this, um, especially up in Canada. Why Canada? Why, why are they hypersensitized to this up there? Who can tell me? No. Um, because they like to use um, analog transceivers up there still. And, well, not necessarily pure analog transceivers like this, but there's other brands that have an analog function, which has certain, certain uh, value for like hearing the number of signals out there. Um, but what they were talking about online was um, the LED on some of these electronic airbags was sounding like a beeping transmitter um, and throwing a few people off. Uh, so that's where it all came from. Um, if you have a digital, purely digital transceiver like most of us own, it's not an issue at all. 
Um, and yes, uh, when we were testing our airbags, Janie and me and Austin out here in uh, Boulder, we just had the engine. We took, we took it out of the backpack and just took the engine and ran it up to the search unit. Um, and yeah, you, you could pick up some false triggers uh, from, uh, yeah, 10 centimeters in. But when you're wearing an airbag, like this awesome Float E235, <laughs> with side stash technology, <laughs> those are my skins. I never take my pack off anymore, ever. Um, yeah, so. You know, this, the engine is way back here. Um, I'm searching here, even if I'm searching up against my chest, I'm not picking up any false triggers. I might be able to pick up a few if I stick this inside my side stash pocket. Let's see. That's going to get me close to, it's a little bit like doing a prostate exam. You just kind of shove it in there, see if you get a false trigger. Oh, there it is. I can, I kind of get one when I stick it inside that pocket every once in a while. Kind of like that electric sock. There. But is that how you beacon search? Not me. So. Um, up against my chest, I'm not, I'm not picking any false triggers, and definitely not out here. So that's where it came from, that uh, wife's tale, or <clears throat> partner's tale. Um, okay, other items. Montana, this is uh, one of the GPS. I have a fancy uh, heavy duty GPS that I, uh, I've owned for a while. It, it's got a huge screen on it. Um, yeah, this thing. It's got a massive screen. It's like a mini TV. See that screen? And when that's up, you know, it's a color screen and it's big. So it, it puts out more EMI than my inReach. Um, Bluetooth earbuds, those things that you put in here and listen to podcasts or um, dead bootlegs, bootlegs when you're skinny. Um, you, can, you can create some issues if you put your transceiver up to your ears. I don't search that way. I know Manuel does, but I don't. Um, Okay, here's something that, that we need to do more research on is there's some digital radios out there, the big five watt units that the ski patrols use. Uh, Snowbird Ski Patrol apparently just bought a brand new fleet of digital VHF radios and um, they're having noise issues. And they found they have to separate their radio by a, a meter from the searching transceiver uh, before they get away from the range loss or false triggers. Uh, we need to do some more work at that. You know, I, I don't have radios like that. Um, um, and most of the radios we've tested, you know, Janie, we had, had a Motorola such and such of Austin's from CAIC. We didn't really have any, any issues, but there are some out there. And I think it's kind of a new technology where you can actually, uh, it's like a, I forget the name of the category, but this was a Kenwood, um, I forget the model number, but we, we need to do more research here. But that's probably not a concern for most of the people in this room. Unless you're poaching FAA or FCC frequencies on your biofang radio, which is illegal. Okay, and then we talked about the sleds. All right. Here's the bottom line on how to mitigate these problems is when you're in transmit mode, you know, I have my, I keep mine in a harness here. Um, just don't put anything on top of it, you know. Keep it 20 centimeters away. 20 centimeters is eight inches, you know. Put your cell phone here or your chocolate bar here, 
or your shovel. <clears throat> um, now, why so far away? I mean, we've noticed that really, even if it's on top, all it really does is change the distance readings a little and make the lights jump around a little bit and maybe use a little more battery power. Well, let's say Adam, let's say he was at 60%, 63%, like I was the other day. And he was touring all day and maybe he went to the, he did some trailhead tests and he did some beacon training park work and uh, he was down to 50% and then he got buried for 25 minutes. <clears throat> And then you put this on top, uh, and it starts to suck, suck battery power out of your, trans, your uh, transmit unit. Well, then it starts to become a bit of an issue, especially if he's buried for a week. He's probably not going to survive that, but it's going to be a real pain in the neck for the people that are trying to find him. So and in an avalanche, you don't have control over where you put your transceiver in relation to the other electronics. So in an avalanche, this thing could get shoved over on top of your transceiver somehow. That, that's why we say 20 meters away. So it's less likely to get shoved on top and drain your batteries. Um, okay, so that's transmitting. That's this 20 centimeters away. Searching, you want 50 centimeters. You saw from my chart that everything from 50 centimeters, everything from basically 20 centimeters out is, is green except snowmobiles and these radios that we're still investigating. So 50 centimeters distance, that's one arm's length. Just, that's good, that's good search technique. You should always be searching like this. You're not gonna be in here like this. So just remember that, always at arm's length. So transmit one hand away, put your, and then arm's length when you're searching. And then with sleds, Three meters, that's the length of a snowmobile. And this stuff about calling on a, okay. Okay, so I think we already talked about this and I have how much time left? Okay. <laughs> Environmental noise. Basically, if you're having a hard time uh, picking up a signal, just do smaller search strips, and eventually you'll pick up the signal maybe closer in. Same thing if, with signal overlap. Reduce your search strips, go into search mode, and you'll be able to find somebody uh, easier. Okay, the last thing I want to do is the fiction part. We talked about all the facts about transceivers. Now I want to talk about the fiction, all the wives' tales. Um, partner's tails. Um, a cell phone near a transmitting transceiver will block the signal. Is that true? If I put this on top of my transmitting unit. It won't block it, it'll just change the strength. It's just going to change the signal strength a little bit. Yeah. Not a deal killer. So that, that's a fiction. Oops. A cell phone near a searching transceiver will prevent you from finding a companion. So is that true? If I'm searching and my transceiver is here and I'm searching here, is that going to? Not really. I mean, if I'm like within 10 centimeters, I might lose the signal. Yeah, but am I going to search that way? No, just extend your, your arm. Um, a goo packet. Energy bar wrapper or a power bar. Has anybody ever tried to eat a power bar in the wintertime? <laughs> That's an owie. Um, near your transmitting transceiver will block the signal. Is that true? No. No. It's just uh, some metal on top. And we found that it actually has to be on top of the, the back of the transceiver, not even the display but the back, because that's where the antennas are. It has to be right up against it, and then you might get a couple of extra meters. You know, instead of saying 21 meters, it might say 23. Okay, that's, that's a, a fiction. You should always put your cell phone in airplane mode when touring. Well, is that true? Well, it's 
good idea because you'll save battery power um, and maybe you won't get telemarketing calls. Um, but that's another partner's tale. You should turn off all electronic devices when performing a rescue. Well, I want my phone. I mean, I'm gonna, I want search and rescue. If I call search and rescue, they're gonna wanna call me back. They, you know, they're gonna wanna know vitals and they're gonna wanna know where we are. We might, they might, we might tell them, hey, we're on channel four, privacy code three. When you get close on your snowmobiles, call us and we can, we can lead you in real time. Um, that, that's how they do it a lot of times now. They start using the radios when they get close. Well, I want that radio on. I want that cell phone on. So you can turn it off if you want, but I wouldn't. And um, it's going to cost you time. And time is everything. You should move 25 meters away from a searcher if calling 911. Where did that one come from? Well, um, uh, I could call somebody right now on my phone. You'll see it makes no difference whatsoever. It, it's not the... The frequency that we use on a cell phone is completely different than the frequency we use in a transceiver. So when you make a phone call, there's no issues. Okay, will you permanently detune your transceiver and your companion's transceiver if, if you're doing a trailhead test and they touch each other like this? <laughs> I'm glad to hear you're laughing because they've been saying this for years in avalanche courses. And it's a complete false it. It's not true. Um, temporarily, you will detune the antenna and drain some of the batteries, but it's a temporary condition. And as soon as you pull apart, that physics is no longer happening. Electronic airbags put out enough EMI to disrupt a search. No. OK, maybe if you have a super sensitive analog transceiver, maybe you'll hear those beeps. But they've actually reduced the number of beeps on the LEDs now on the All Pride system. So it's every 10 seconds instead of every three seconds. So it doesn't really sound like a transceiver anymore. And the LEDs are quieter. So they've done a software update that basically solves that particular concern. Never use a GoPro in the backcountry? Well, if you're a sponsored athlete, you better use one. Um, but don't put it on your chest. Never use a transceiver that doesn't have three antennas. Well, that one's kind of debatable. I consider the third antenna a luxury. It's, it's unrelated to noise, but just keep in mind that the third antenna is only for the fine search for the last couple of meters. It's got nothing to do with multiple burials, nothing to do with receive range. It just cleans up the fine search so you don't get little, little hiccups in the signal. It's a long story, but the important thing is don't use an analog transceiver. It's much more important than not having a three antenna transceiver. It's much more important to have digital than an analog than it is to have a three antenna versus a two antenna digital. So um, don't even put your old analog transceiver on your dog. Um, because as I told you before, it sends out a very long pulse, and it can cover up other pulses and overlap and make it harder to find the human. Um, and the other thing is, uh, they're very difficult to use. Don't, 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 don't use one for searching. There was a case a couple weeks ago where up at um, Corona Pass, unfortunately, where there was a guy whose two buddies got buried. And uh, actually, Andy Wenberg, the guy I was at Bale Pass with, was teaching an avalanche course and uh, was on scene when this happened and <clears throat> had to go probing. But um, the guy who was not buried had one of these, which was great in its time. He didn't have a trouble shovel or a probe. All he had was this. And he didn't, couldn't even figure out how to go into search mode. Um, from what I've heard. It, it's complicated. Now once you do go into search mode, you have to adjust the sensitivity and walk around and complicated search patterns. It's kind of a no-brainer. Just, But don't even put it on your dog. Send it to me. I'll give it to my 
people, and I'll give you a good deal on a tracker. Okay, I think we're done. I was gonna do a little noise hunting, but kind of already did that, and uh, I think I'm out of time, so.